persecución de la realidad virtual. Uh, please help me to welcome Steve. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you again, Rafael, for the kind invitation to speak here. I've, I've spoken here several times before, and I always appreciate a, a visit here. It's a great place to collaborate and uh, spend time with friends. Um, so as Rafael said, I've worked in robotics for many years. Um, this is my research lab at the University of Illinois, a picture I took while I was away at the uh, company Oculus. Um, my students have graduated and gone from, from their robotics projects and are off doing other things. And um, I'm currently rebuilding my lab based on some of my new interests, which came from this experience that I will describe next, which was from Oculus. So um, maybe most of you have heard about this, maybe not, I don't know. But um, um, there was a company started in, um, in Southern California in the US um, by Palmer Lucky when he was 19 years old. That was in uh, July of 2012. Um, there was a crowdfunding event, Kickstarter, that generated a couple of million dollars for making a virtual reality headset using very low cost components that came from the smartphone industry. I joined as a consultant a few days after that and um, started developing software with them. Some of the basic mathematics and head tracking and things like that were very important, so we worked on that. We shipped the first development kit just while the company was a few months old. We sold about 70,000 of them. Um, and I joined at that time as the, the head scientist. And then um, we took funding from investors and the value of the company grew very, very fast. It went from 16 million in June of 2013 very quickly to, I guess by the, by the, <clears throat> by the end of 2013, it was 275 million. And then just a couple of months later, about a little more than one year ago, it was purchased for $2 billion by, um, um, by Facebook. And so by that time, we had a second development kit that was shipping out. And uh, we had a chance to try it here in Rafael's office. And um, I, unfortunately, it's very hard for me to demonstrate to a large audience because it's an individual experience. So it would take us until midnight to, to finish the demonstrations. Um, I hope you have a chance to, return to, to try it sometime. I returned to the University of Illinois as a professor um, uh, about a half a year ago. So um, my background is in robot motion planning. And um, even though, and of course, Rafael and his team has, have excellent experience in that. Um, they're, they're doing um, excellent world-class research in that area. And um, the important thing about it is that it goes down to searching through a space of transformations. And so the numerical computations and algorithms and sampling, things we do on that space of transformations ended up being very, very useful for Oculus. And so there is some connection between robotics and motion planning. In fact, um, they were... Uh, Googling for uh, these, these kinds of transformations, doing a search, and they found pieces of my book online. And so that's how I got connected to the company. Um, so this is the book that I've had that's been, I wrote it um, a, over a decade ago, and um, it's been online for free, and that's how I got connected to the company, because they searched for quaternions and Euler angles and transformations and things, and I started consulting for them. Um, I was working on a second book after that. I was very interested in the foundations of sensing and filtering, doing more fundamental mathematical kind of research on that. I wrote a small book a couple of years ago called Sensing and Filtering with a different kind of perspective on it. And then I went to a, on a sabbatical to Finland to work on a much larger book. And, um, and so I went to, oops, I went to this place here um, up in northern Finland. I like to get far away so I can concentrate and write a book. Um, and um, as I started writing some of the chapters, my life got disrupted by this 19-year-old uh, uh, Palmer Lucky. So sometimes they call it disruptive technology. So my life was disrupted um, by this. So that changed the plans. The book hasn't been finished yet. Virtual reality has been around for quite a long time. Um, I was born in 1968, and at that time, Ivan Sutherland made the first virtual reality headset that had CRT monitors in front of your eyes and presented some, some stereo images with just some lines that were drawn. So it was fairly simple, but a fairly complex, heavy device at the time. So things evolved quite a bit. By the 1990s, there was a lot of hype, a lot of excitement about virtual reality. Anyone remember that hype? Was anybody around for that? Right? You remember that? You've heard about this before? So... Um, if you want to see how crazy it was, watch this uh, really bad movie called Lawnmower Man, and you can, you can see how excited people were. Um, well, it got all the way up to, um, you know, in industry, there was the Nintendo Virtual Boy in the mid-90s, and um, this was a commercial disaster. So it was not really virtual reality in the sense like we know it today. It was just a device on top of a table, and you look inside, and you see all black but with red lines, and you try to fuse that together. It gave people headaches. 
and you try to play a three-dimensional Mario tennis or something, and it wasn't very, was not very successful. So it became a very big hype technology from the 90s, and then after that, people knew to stay away from it, especially people who wanted to make money, do business. They thought, this is a disaster. Right? Um, interesting, what were the big things from the 1990s? Um, the web browser, right? And then people started making too many web pages and then it came search engines, right? So those were the big things in the 90s, not this. However, I feel like the time is ready for virtual reality, as did Palmer Lucky and many of us in this company. The problem before was that the components were not ready yet, the technological pieces. Because of the smartphone industry, we have the pieces now. We have better displays, better sensors, better computation better graphics processing, so we can do these things now. That's what's amazing about it. Um, it's interesting to try to define virtual reality. I'm not really sure what to make of it. Uh, Philip Rosedale was the, um, the, the founder and CEO of um, Second Life. You may have tried before. Here's a dictionary definition. It looks like that one depends on technology too much. I like Philip's. I'm going to give my definition, which is similar to Philip's, but I, I want to say that the definition for me, I, I mean, mathematicians like definitions, right? But this is not a subject that is, is easy for making concrete definitions. But I like to at least work with something. The idea is to induce some kind of targeted interactive behavior in an organism, which could be a human or could be some other animal. I don't care. And um, you do it by providing artificial sensory stimulation. And the organism, while experiencing it, should have little or no awareness of the interference. They should forget about it or not even know that there's interference. That's how it should be. So I'll give you some examples. Um, up here, this is almost virtual reality, right, for, a, for, a, for a, a hamster. And again, for a human who does the same thing, right? And down here, I would say this probably is virtual reality. This was done at the University of Olu in Finland. It's a cockroach running on a foam ball being shown visual stimuli. So the, the roach runs along, and you can manipulate the roach. So that seems like virtual reality. And here are humans trying to do the same thing, right, So in, with virtual reality headsets on. So it's important to think of it as an organism because the organism is part of the system. It's, it's an engineering system and a human system that come together. And the interface between them becomes very challenging. Uh, how real should the virtual reality be? Well, it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to take a university course? Do you want to maintain a long distance relationship? Um, here's one that most people under the age of 20 want to do, play a first person shooter game. Uh, maybe virtual travel. Um, so you could show people the experience of Guanajuato from all over the world. They could come and virtually travel, watch a live theater performance. Maybe you want to write software in virtual reality, right? You just want to use debuggers and things, right? So who knows? It depends on what you want. So it's important to maintain a baseline, though, of at least comfort and safety, which is very challenging, and some form of belief. In other words, you, you're, not, you're not hampered by the technology. You feel like you're in this new environment, and it, it's, it's wonderful, right? So, so hopefully it should feel like that. But, but as a, at a minimum, it should have this comfort and safety. Um, my personal interest was that um, I wanted to bring people together to make it easier for people with limited mobility to interact with each other and feel present together. This is my grandma and her sister. They were separated after World War II. Um, the, um, the Nazis um, suggested that they move to Germany. Um, they, 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 were, they, were, they were from a small village in eastern Poland. And um, they only saw each other twice in 60 years. And the second time was when I took that picture myself. I was a graduate student then. And, and after that, it was always hard to get my grandma to go back to see her sister. I got them to talk on the phone, sometimes to use Skype. But if they could just put on a headset and feel like they are present together, I thought that would be wonderful. So people with limited mobility, or especially elderly people, they may have a chance to experience much more by virtually moving around and feeling present in some virtual environment or in a real environment. Just put an omnidirectional camera there and they can look around and feel like they are present and hear the sounds and si see the sights. So we started working on this. Uh, the company was very small in the beginning. Um, there were only a few people. There was more than that than just in that picture. I think that's Palmer Lucky there. But um, So the people were working in California on it. My wife, uh, Anna Yershova, and I were working on it in, in Finland. We were consulting. So um, this looks like Scandinavian furniture there, you can see. Um, um, the company bought us a robot. They were very suspicious because they said, oh, yeah, robotics professor wants us to buy a robot. Sure. You know. But I told them, no, the robots are not toys for me. These are serious things. You, know, you guys think they're toys. You know? For me, it's just work. So we put the sensor on the end of our, on the robot, and we did very careful studies for tracking and calibration of the sensor. And we were developing these filtering and tracking methods. Also, I could put the sensor outside of the window in Finland and then bring it back in to study the temperature dependence of the sensor because it was about you know, maybe 
uh, minus 10 Celsius outside, and then I could bring it inside where it was 20 Celsius, and then you could see how the sensor performs over a temperature range very easily. In California, it was very hard to do that. So. Um, that's humor of some kind. Okay, let's see. Um, there we go. Now we go. Um, so, so this thing grew very fast. We sold 70,000 of these. They were 300 US dollars a piece. Um, we contributed to, my wife and I were writing together with the software team, this uh, open source um, uh, SDK, software development kit. We leveraged video game middleware like Unity 3D and Unreal Engine to make it very easy for developers to make content. And there was a big active community of people following us and we all kind of grew up together. We had hackathons and a virtual reality game jam. Finally, for virtual reality, there was a low barrier to entry. It was very easy to get started. The software was easy to write. The hardware was very low cost, so very easy to finally match the high enthusiasm that people had for virtual reality. So we were able to do that. And I started watching, I started watching what kinds of things people were doing with it. So while writing software at Oculus, I would take a break and then search on YouTube to see what people are doing. This was one of my favorites because it reminded me of my grandma. Um, some guy put it on his 90-year-old grandmother. You can just do a Google search for Grandma Oculus, and you'll see this video where she's screaming with excitement right away. You, don't, you do not have to explain this technology to anybody. You just stick it on their face, and they understand. If you try explaining it, they'll never get it. You know, so. Um, so, so she went walking around in virtual Tuscany and had a great time. For me, I was tired of virtual Tuscany. That was our demonstration program. So I spent many, many hours inside of there trying to debug it and make it perfect. So um, it, trying to make sure all the tracking was working and the optics and so many things. So for me, Tuscany was like a virtual prison, but, 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 for, but for Grandma Oculus, it was, it was a great uh, experience. Um, people can socialize in virtual spaces. This is from, this is from something called OpenSim, Open Simulator, which is an open source alternative to Second Life. I gave a, this is me. I gave a keynote address at a conference with 200 people that were all connected together, but I was just sitting in my house, you know, wearing who knows what and just uh, talking and uh, they could hear me and they asked a lot of great questions and they were blogging while I was talking. It was wonderful. In my memory, I feel like I was at a real conference, even though at the moment I knew I was not. I took a trip to Finland a few weeks ago and I met a guy at the university there who said, I was at your talk. I'm like, really? <laughs> what did your avatar look like? I don't know, but, but anyway, so, you know, so it was great. Um, people are using it for architecture. So I noticed many people, especially if they have a very small place, like a lot of young people in East Asia, like in uh, Tokyo, um, Seoul, uh, Shanghai, they, they, they're in a very tiny space. So they, tended to want to, they tend to want to make very large inside spaces to relax, right? So imagine you can invite your friends over to your palace, right? And then they get jealous and they have to make their own virtual palace with fountains and, you know, all kinds of things. So. So, so, so it's very nice. Of course, there are real uses in architecture and visualization in general for virtual prototyping and engineering, many things you can do. Um, this was an interesting experience called virtual reality cinema. When I first heard about this, I thought it was pointless. The idea is um, it just takes whatever movies are on your hard drive and streams them to a movie screen inside of a virtual movie theater. So in virtual reality, you're sitting inside of a theater. You can pick which seat you want, and you look back, and the projector is flickering and the sound is echoing off of the walls, and you can watch the movie in 2D or 3D. <laughs> Very strange. Um, and it's amazing. When I put that on my kids, that was the only experience that, that kept them for half an hour. They just felt like they were at the theater, and it looked amazing. So. Very hard to explain why this is so, so great. It, one thing that was interesting was it also gave the ability to leverage the content that already exists. There's movies everywhere, so now you can watch them in virtual reality, and you can enhance the experience without changing the movie. You could watch a movie about zombies and have zombies appear in the movie theater, right? You can have movie night with your friends and all get together and do whatever you want. You can, you can, you can launch grenades inside of the theater. Who cares, right? You can have fun together while you're inside the theater. Do anything you want and you will not be thrown out of the theater, right? Um, panoramas. So connecting it to Google Street View, one of the very early applications. Somebody wrote this and had it running even before we released our headset. I don't, I don't know how they figured it out, but they got it all working before our headset was completely delivered. And we tried it out, and it was amazing. Is this virtual reality? Is this augmented reality? Is this delayed reality? I don't really know. In the 1990s, people imagined virtual reality as like a cartoon-like environment, right? Very artificial. But this is real image data from Google Street View. And you just connect to it, and you look all around, and it's amazing. You feel like you're there. And um, right away inside the company, we all took turns showing each other where we grew up. You could see the house where we lived, and it feels like you're right there on the street in a, in a bright, sunny day, for example. It's very nice. 
Imagine extending this to having a live video camera with all directions and omnidirectional microphones. And then connect that to a robot, of course. You know, right? so, so you can have virtual travel then. Like that. The next challenge will be to keep people from getting sick as the vehicle's moving. But that, that's another thing I will talk about shortly. Um, of course, many people started adapting first-person shooter games. And it's easy to do because all of the information is there. But the experience is not necessarily great. It, it leads to some difficulties, which I will talk about soon. Um, my favorite game is this one, which we had a virtual reality game jam or competition. And this one is called Dumpy the Elephant, where you just have a virtual elephant trunk. And as you turn your head, the trunk flops around. <laughs> and the only goal here is to knock stuff down, right? which is fun. So you just move along slowly, and you just try to knock things down with your trunk. So that was one of the winners of the, of the game jam. I found that great. It's a very creative use of this technology, not thinking about adaptation of previous technology. Right? All of the previous technology involves staring at a rectangle, right? a screen. So this is very different. So now you use the fact that, oh yeah, I believe I'm there. And I can use my head as a controller and swing a virtual trunk around. Very good, very creative. Um, of course, people want to make virtual roller coasters, all kinds of crazy things. Um, we had a few people screaming in Raphael's office uh, yesterday. Um, you know, people want to sit in a chair and then ride some crazy ride. Right? Um, my idea which nobody wants to do yet, is I want to actually ride on a roller coaster, but then in virtual reality be sitting in a chair. What do you think? Would that be fun? <laughs> Who wants to do that? I don't know. Um, well, people started getting more and more crazy. Um, it, 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 it turns out that artists do the most interesting things. I found that artists are doing the best, because they're trying to enhance or think about new human experiences, right? They have no constraints of engineering and politics and business. They just want to make cool stuff, really interesting experiences for humans. So of course, the virtual guillotine, or guillotine simulator is great. You look up and you see the blade coming down. And, uh, and then if you have really good friends, they whack you on the neck right when the blade's about to hit. So, if you watch the video of this, you can see, you know, and you can try it yourself if you want to. That's great. Um, oh, and, and it shows the proper perspective as your head is rolling. You can still see through the eyes, right? So, so this must be funny here, right? I mean, was, in Mexico, I always see a fascination with death, you know? So, so this is probably a very good thing to play with, so, you know. <laughs> um, maybe not decapitation normally, but, but okay. But, but, but you know, um, this is even stranger, maybe. So this is um, from a, a university in Barcelona. Um, two, two students. Each wore the headset, and they had cameras on, in front of the headset so that each could look through the eyes of the other by swapping positions. And then they did coordinated motions like this. So you look down. The man looks down and sees the woman's body and goes like this. And the woman's doing the same and sees the man's body. So you can exchange bodies. And think about this in general in virtual environments for empathy. If you have problems with race and gender, anything, you can, you can make yourself appear differently to other people. And that gives you a chance to appreciate you know, differences between people. It gives you a chance to, to feel empathy. If someone complains about gender issues or racism, well, you can be in their place in virtual reality and see what it feels like. Right? It's very hard for people to imagine the first person perspective of how they are treated. Right? Um, well, let's see. Let's talk about some more things here. So how does this stuff work? Well, the screen is divided into two halves. And now the technology is getting so advanced that they are making individual screens for each eye. But you know, to start with, you just take a smartphone screen, you divide it in half, and then you put a magnifying lens in front of each. And that's it. You, you set the lens so that it looks like the screen is really large and infinitely far away, like extremely far away. So that's how it appears. It's always in focus, which is a little strange. And then you have to also compensate for a distortion in the optics, because these also start to become like fish-eyed lenses. So there's some distortion to compensate for. But that's OK. You can fix that in software. You can make it look distorted, like it is here. These, look, these walls look distorted. That's because when the lens hits it, it becomes a kind of annihilation of the two distortions. This one is, um, hmm, that looks like barrel distortion. But I think it's supposed to be um, pincushion distortion. And then, um, yeah, it should be, no, oh, that's right. It's rendered in barrel, sorry. This is rendered with barrel distortion because the lens causes what's called pincushion distortion, which is the opposite. And then when you put the two together, you get what I call pincushion barrel annihilation, and the two collapse. Sounds like a very mathematical concept, right? They are mathematical inverses, right? And we know what happens when you put those together. You get the beautiful identity, right? So, OK. Um, so inside of these devices, the first main sensing technology we use is inertial measurement units. 
So the same kind that are in your smartphone. So we have um, a little more sophisticated, but not too bad. Um, these are in iPhones now, I think, this generation or better. Um, so you have a gyroscope accelerometer. There's a microcontroller, standard arm microcontroller, and a magnetometer for extra fun. Um, these measure angular and linear accelerations at 1,000 hertz, at least the gyroscope does. Sorry, gyroscope measures angular velocity, and the accelerometer measures linear accelerations at 1,000 hertz. Magnetometer is pretty fast also. Um, so we have all of this data. We have three dimensions of data of, um, for each of the three main sensors. And so the work we did was to provide head tracking. So you have to somehow integrate and fuse the sensor data to determine which way you were looking because you have to present the right data. If we were in virtual reality now and I look at the clock, the clock has to appear there, right? And, and, and it has to be there not uh, 100 milliseconds later. It needs to be there right on time. So otherwise, the brain will, be, will notice the difference. Maybe you'll notice it consciously or subconsciously. You may become uncomfortable. Right? So these are the kind of problems you have to deal with. Well, that's very nice. Um, you have to avoid kinematic singularities using things like quaternions or some other axis angle representations. And um, you end up doing filtering on these 3D transformation groups, which people in robotics end up knowing sometimes. Right? So, so it's very nice. There's a mathematical connection. And sometimes they don't. And their robots do bad things. Um, <laughs> So I, I like to say to people that quaternions are not just for breakfast anymore. You can eat them all day long. So, so it's quite a, um, maybe, this, maybe this joke doesn't fully translate here. But, um, you know, we, we eat cereal for breakfast. And then people sometimes claim you can eat cereal all day long. So quaternions are, are so ubiquitous in some sense. So we have 3D rotations. And we end up favoring axis angle representations. That's Euler's rotation theorem that gives us that every 3D rotation can be expressed as a rotation about um, an axis through the origin and some amount of degrees or radians of rotation. And of course, it's a double representation because the axis could be pointing in either direction. So it's a two to one mapping. Um, if I explain how the basic integration works, just to show a little bit of math today, because it's probably a terrible crime to not really show a little bit of math if you're at the CMOTs, right? So, um, uh, but this is nothing advanced at all, of course. <laughs> um, so imagine in two dimensions, you have this, what we call a merry-go-round. So it's spinning around. and um, if you want to figure out the um, roughly, approximately, what angle this is pointing at, then you just update the angle for each change in time by omega, which is the angular velocity. So this would be the omega is radians per second. That's just simple Euler in in integration. And of course, the thing to think about is if you keep doing this, assume your delta t is very small. We, we, for us, it's one millisecond. And as you go along, so, so the, the angular velocity is changing. You're just adding this up and integrating. You should think about drift errors, which for roboticists we know as dead reckoning error. You command your robot to go somewhere and it starts drifting away, right? So we have that kind of problem here with this sort of integration to integrate the velocity, the angular velocity. What's neat is, to me, is this is such a simple formula. Shouldn't it also be simple in, for three-dimensional rotation? And uh, the answer is yes, although most people on the internet don't seem to find the simple solution. If you Google for solutions, you get all kinds of really long things, maybe dragging through Euler angles and other complicated things. Um, so one of the first things we did um, was, um, you know, you just take the three-dimensional gyro reading. So this is giving the instantaneous rotation all by the x, y, and z axes. And um, if you just look at the length of that vector, um, something very nice happens, which is that the length of that vector is the rate of rotation in radians per second. And the direction of this vector, if you just normalize it and use it as a normal vector, that does give you the instantaneous axis of rotation. So that's amazing. So that's just directly telling you in one snapshot what the, what the axis of rotation is and how fast it's rotating. So all you got to do is just build that up, do the same kind of integration, but just use quaternions so that we can make a simple formula like that one. And so basically, you just make the axis, make the angle, write a quaternion class in C++ or whatever, and just give it the axis and angle to construct this, this um, small change angle that you, this changing that you did and then just multiply it on to the cumulative orientation. So the integration is very similar. It just looks like multiplication here because of the, of the non-commutative algebra of quaternions, right? So for, or of 3D rotation, I should say. It's the fault of 3D rotation. In 2D, it's commutative, so you can write plus signs. So that's why that's a plus and that's a times. But who cares? You guys know enough group theory. It doesn't matter. All right. Um, well, then we worried about drift error, and we had to do some plots and study it with the robot, and the rate of drift grows under different velo angular velocities, things like that. So we were very systematic. We tried to be scientific as much as you can in a company that needs to make things work fast. Right? So it's kind of a trade-off. 
Um, so to do drift correction, you try to measure some kind of exterior vector field that's poking through your head, let's say, while you're wearing this, and um, um, try to measure it and then use it to, to realign yourself, right? To correct for drift errors. That's how you do it. Um, so that's what we did. Um, so there's two kinds of errors. There's tilt error, which handles the pitch and roll case. So that's, tilt is just like it sounds. It might be that you think the head is level, but really it's like this. It's tilted in some way. So it could be tilted this way or tilted this way. It's, it's, um, so those are two different, we call them pitch and roll angles. And so what we'd like to have is a gravity sensor because gravity is always down. So if I know which way down is with respect to the headset, then I can correct, right? So all we got to do is go to a Radio Shack and buy a gravity sensor, right? Unless you've studied some relativity and other things, you may see a problem with it. Um, and then for the yaw error, which is which direction am I facing, um, you have to, you solve, we solve, let's say, with a compass, right? The yaw error was a problem. People would be playing a game where there's a cockpit, like, a, like a, um, a spaceship or an aircraft, and over time the cockpit starts drifting away like this. And then if they have a rotating chair, they would rotate with it. <laughs> and then after 45 minutes of playing, they become wound up in the cables, and we look like fools, right, for making something like this, right? But that's the drift error. So we had to compensate for that as well. Um, it was very challenging, and I don't have time to go into th these kinds of details, but I just want to point out that we don't really have a gravity sensor, we just have an accelerometer. And all the accelerometer can do is measure the vector sum of gravity plus your actual head acceleration, right, as you're moving your head around. And so you only get the vector sum, and so it's very difficult to separate that out and figure out which component is, you know, what is the gravity component. You could say, okay, if the length of the vector is 9.8 meters per second squared, then that must be pure gravity. But then you can start moving like this. You start accelerating down to cancel off or subtract some of the Earth's gravity, because that, that's going this way. And then you add some of your own linear acceleration, and you could get the magnitude to be 9.8 and fool this to think that the whole world is tilted. So there are a lot of bad problems like this to do the corrections and such. But um, well, we did a lot of hacking and found some solutions that work, but no interesting theorems, though. So. Um, <clears throat> The same thing was true for the magnetometer, sorry, for, for the compass. We don't have a compass, we have a magnetometer, which measures the vector sum of the Earth's magnetic field, which is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional, so you can be pointing down somewhere. And there's fields inside of the building, and there are fields inside of the circuit board. So you get the vector sum of all of those, and you have to deal with that mess. So that's one thing we worked on for quite a while as well. I have some Oculus blog posts where I talked about these things in more detail if you are interested. Oh, and a paper at ICRA, the Robotics and Automation Conference last year that also talks about these things. Um, a big problem we had is latency. And n not only does it, you know, it might take time to, you know, as you turn your head and you get these sensor data over, over, the, over the USB line and uh, the game engine, this is an engine, right, so uh, does the computations to update the scene, then everything has to be scanned out to the display. And if you're using an older LCD display, then you have to wait for the pixels to switch. Um, we've recently solved those kind of problems, but it takes a lot of time to go through this pipeline. And so your filtering method, you know, the game engine needs to know which way your head is looking in order to figure out what to draw in the world. And so the problem is that it's going to take a long time from this point all the way to the end, or in fact, this is where your information is coming from. It's going to take a long time to figure that out. So prediction becomes very important so that you do not perceive latency. Latency was one of the biggest problems, or delay was one of the biggest problems in making virtual reality work back in the 1990s. So I started working on that. I started hacking on it one time, visiting from Finland, and um, hacked up something in a couple of hours that worked really well, it turned out. Um, and I couldn't figure out why, because after I later heard from virtual reality experts that predictive tracking doesn't work. But I wrote something in a couple of hours that worked you know, pretty well, so I could not figure out this problem. And, and so I thought about it carefully, and here's what's changed since the 1990s. In the 1990s, um, you had to predict over a very long interval, like 80 milliseconds was considered short because everything was so slow then. You might have to predict 100 milliseconds in the future or further. So that's a question. How far into the future do we need to predict? Also, how much data do we need from the past in order to predict, to, to extract the trend? If you're getting vision data at 60 hertz, then you might need 100 milliseconds of data to, to analyze the trend. If you have a gyroscope at 1,000 hertz, it's already giving you the angular velocity. You might only need, I don't know, one, two, three milliseconds of data. So you do not need to reach into the past too much, and you do not need to predict into the future very much. Our latencies were around 35 milliseconds at that time. Um, so that's how it looks. So in the beginning, 
you have very sparse data and you have to predict very far. Now we have very dense data and we do not predict as far. And this data is already velocities, which anyone who's tried to estimate derivatives numerically from noisy data will know it only gets worse, right, as you, as you go further. It gets better as you integrate, it gets worse as you take derivatives, right? Noise tends to amplify. Uh, numerical analysts all know this and people who do work in practice. Um, so, I, I, so I made a very simple method that just extrapolates the, um, the angular velocity forward to try to predict into the future so that it cancels off the latency, right? So that's how we did it. So I did a simple experiment. This is me going like this. And every time I turn my head and change direction, you get this spike, and this is the number of degrees of error. And then I made a simple method that just tries to do a smooth estimate of the angular velocity um, and, and extrapolates it forward. And then I got the red line, which is better. And then I worked for a couple of weeks on something that I thought was going to be way better. I thought I'd be really smart now. I was getting overconfident. And I, made, I decided to make this method that produced the yellow line, which had better average error and better worst error, worst case error. So it's just better and better, right? And so I thought, that's great. So I gave it to one of my colleagues to try who's very sensitive, like he's very careful watching, very, very, very much in particular, Peter Giocaris, who worked on the Unity. He developed the Unity 3D integration of Oculus. And um, um, it turned out that the better method was worse. He said, it's worse. And I was like, it can't be worse. I used engineering and science, and I did experiments, and I have plots. It's better, 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 better. It can't be worse. And he said, OK, here's what happens. With the new method, he said, when you just stare, when you do not move your head, he could see jitter, like shaking in the image. But when you turn your head, then he agreed that it looked better. So the latency was going down, but there were some regions where human perception, if you just take that into account, it's worse. So that made me think, wow, we have to take human perception into account. Um, so it's very interesting. And, and one way to look at it is that the more you try to smooth something, a signal, right? You have a noisy signal. The more you try to smooth it, the more you introduce delay, right? So therefore, the more aggressive you try to be with prediction, the more you unsmooth it because you're reaching into the future, right? This is an example of how smooth data looks. It's noisy, and this is how it looks when it's smoothed. When you zoom in on the sensor data, it looks like this a lot, but this is only a stock market data, but you know, similar enough, right? All right. Um, so that got me into doing perceptually tuned filtering. So when you're stationary, you do not do much prediction uh, because latency cannot be perceived, but jitter can, which is shaking. And then when you do a quick motion, it switches gradually into a mode of um, latency being easily perceived, but not jitter. So it does more prediction. So we traded these things off. And that was a new kind of tracking method, um, as far as I know. And um, um, that helped us to make better methods. Well, then that really got me thinking further, wow, um, the human vision and human perception part is very important here. So um, I started thinking about it, all the different problems we were having in the company and these adverse effects we were having. And it's so complicated across different people. And they're not even consciously aware of the problems while they're developing the software or the hardware. Very difficult problems. So, um, so I hired a couple of uh, perceptual psychologists. So we had a small team of perceptual psychologists. And we were working together to provide things like a best practices guide for providing advice to developers. We worked on things like health and safety, you know, working, getting into legal issues and things like this. So, um, so it was very interesting, and, and that helped us a lot to understand and improve the technology. And it continues to be a problem. Let me give you one thing I learned. So this is the human vestibular organ, a picture of it. We have one inside of each ear. And this is pretty much measuring the exact same things the gyroscope and accelerometer are measuring. So that's very interesting. The human body has already engineered sensors that are very similar to what we have in our smartphones. And then, many people do not know about this. Has anyone heard of the vestibulo-ocular reflex? So, no hands going up, or you're tired, I don't know. Uh, so, if you put like your, your thumb in front of your face and you turn your head back and forth like this, your thumb remains stationary. But notice that as you rotate your head, your eye is counter-rotating, right? So that's a very interesting thing. So that's going on all the time, and it's bypassing your brain. There's a 10 millisecond delay in that loop. So it's very short, very short feedback loop between your vestibular organs and your eye muscles. So it's incredible. And if you're wearing glasses, your brain learns a different rotation rate because of the distortion due to your glasses. And if you're wearing a bad virtual reality headset, your brain might learn that rate. And then when you leave, you come out into the real world, and the real world doesn't look right and starts swimming around. So crazy stuff happens here. And people are barely aware of it. Um, if you move yourself in VR, 
you end up with an interesting problem. So um, everyone wants to sit down and then move their character around, right? Well, when you do that, you end up with a problem called vection, which is um, you see optical flow. So when I go forward to you, I'm afraid not, I don't want to go too far forward, um, then I see optical flow, right? Outward and then inward, I get side flow like this. When I rotate, I get flow. Um, so when I, when I do this, I see optical flow, and that is a perception of acceleration. And my vestibular organ also perceives acceleration. And those two are in agreement in the real world. When I'm sitting in a chair moving around like this, right, then um, <clears throat> you know, I'm moving forward in, as convinced by my eyes, right? My, my brain believes I'm moving forward, but the vestibular system knows you're not. And after a while, may, some people get sick, right? Maybe your brain thinks you've been poisoned. There's a mismatch, right? So that's a problem. Um, let's see. Maybe now I'll finally remember I have this. Okay. Um, so there's different levels of understanding. The first is, oh, I've never heard of that before. And then, okay, people say, all right, maybe just moving in VR while motionless in the physical world is bad. Okay, maybe. And maybe that's the only thing to worry about. Then people say, okay, maybe only make sure that accelerations are not mismatched between the real world and the virtual world. I, I'm sort of at level four right now, which I think is not the final level, which is, um, are we sure that even if you move at constant velocity, so there's no accelerations, your avatar is moving perfectly along a straight line at constant speed, I still think it's kind of uncomfortable because it's a very smooth ride and you see things going by and I don't think that's 100% comfortable either. So very interesting and there's a lot of research to do on how to move your avatar comfortably um, for large groups of people. Um, most of the undergraduate students I show it to who play a lot of first person shooter games don't get sick at all. So they've been training themselves on big screens when, and this vection problem seems to go away. So it suggests that you can train. Also, there's some higher level problems. People just adapt games. Like if you adapt a game from virtual reality to, um, to adapt a game from a screen to virtual reality, maybe the camera's not in the right location. There are high level perceptual problems. Like for example, this is a game where the, 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 the camera is right here, right? So if you, on, on a screen, this looks perfect. But then when you put a virtual reality headset on, everyone asks, why am I so short? <laughs> this woman is so tall, this is strange. I'm like, well, you know, another question they ask is, why is that guy so big and so scary, right? On a screen, he's not, but in virtual reality, maybe eight feet tall and looking down on you, it might be very intimidating. So, so even the, the entire intent that's communicated by these designs may be completely altered in virtual reality. So even there are high level cognitive perceptual problems here to address. Um, so we went on, we did more, we got into, um, uh, we added a camera to provide both uh, orientation tracking and position tracking. So when you go side to side, you see parallax motions, which are very important. So it's, it's, it's helpful in some settings. It's not necessary in others. It's just kind of a mixed thing. It's unfortunate to have an extra device to attach um, because there are also portable versions of this where you can just carry it anywhere. Um, I don't recommend walking around anywhere blindfolded. But um, so we have all these things. We put a bunch of LEDs around to make the computer vision problem trivial and uninteresting, right? Because you just see LEDs in the infrared spectrum in front of an infrared camera or a camera with an infrared filter. We have higher resolution displays and OLEDs that switch faster, higher resolution. We need a higher frame rate, it turns out. Otherwise, you perceive flicker. It's another problem there. It's a lot of perceptual reasons for these things that I do not have time to go into. Um, and this, this generation of head tracking um, was developed by, uh, mainly by four of us originally, um, all of which are roboticists. And three are, are you know, my wife and I and um, Max Ketsev, who's one of my PhD students as well. So, so it was very interesting. There's roboticists developing this stuff, even though it's not widely known in the news. Um, there's a growing ecosystem. Many companies have jumped in. Uh, Google's going to probably come in with something more serious than this, because this is just kind of a fun thing with cardboard and simple lenses to work on any phone. Uh, Samsung Gear VR is widely available now, easy to buy. Um, it extends your smartphone into a virtual reality experience. Sony's going in for PlayStation 4. Oculus Facebook are there. Uh, Valve has a new headset coming out too as well, the, the leading game company. And it's going on and on. Many people are jumping in. Um, there are new hardware demands. So again, it's interesting to think about the future now. There's a lot of computer engineering kinds of problems mixed with graphics. It's a new generation of computer graphics now. When you put a magnifying glass in front of a screen, you see more pixels now. So the resolutions have to be higher. That makes some people in the screen industry very excited, in the display industry very excited. They can make now, they can now finally push those 4K screens that nobody wants, right? So, 
Um, I delete that nobody wants part from the recording. So I don't, I'm just kidding. All right. Um, so there are you know higher frame rates. We need improved sensors, better optical systems, faster rendering pipeline, and so on. Um, we have software issues all over the place. Many of the components we have were designed for something else. Like they were designed for video games. Or you know, the rendering techniques were designed for graphics on a screen. Well, that will get us most of the way there, but we need something different for virtual reality. I don't know what, like instead of a GPU, we need a VRPU. Instead of a game uh, engine, we need a VR engine. What should those look like? What are we going to do with VR? So it's very complicated. What kind of middleware should we have? Um, model building and scene acquisition needs to be much higher fidelity because you see more flaws, more problems in virtual reality than you see looking on a screen. So a lot of interesting potentials for collaboration with people across many areas. Of course, perceptual psychology and neuroscience, but um, you know, signal processing, dynamical systems, control, filtering, all kinds of things can come in here, computer vision um, as well. Um, and that's just the vision part I showed you. Audio is also very similar. It's an easier problem to a large extent, but it has many of the same kinds of issues. And audio and video together is very powerful. So you take over two senses. There's some more senses you can work with, touch, maybe taste and smell, who knows. Um, you could stimulate your vestibular organ, but I do not recommend it. Um, these all have perceptual components. There's a lot of high-level parts that are very human-oriented. Communications, education, sociology, foreign language. What things is this technology good for as a platform? Just like the computer is a platform for doing many things, or the smartphone is a platform for doing many things. It's called a phone, but what is it mainly used for? Facebook and things like that, right? So it's, it's hard to know what these platforms are going to be good for. Uh, same thing is true here, but I'll say that it's very certainly to me human-centered research all around, you know, for this. Low-level human, as I showed you, very low-level perceptual issues. And now, and there are also very high-level uh, perceptual issues and, and human issues here. So I find that very exciting. Um, one new project that I'm excited about is um, I started thinking about an education where would being fully immersed make the biggest difference? And I think in second language acquisition. So one vision I have right now is to try to connect classrooms between the US and Mexico to, um, to have children be able to communicate live as each tries to learn the other's language. Right? So that's one possibility. Um, I, I, I met this morning, for example, with the director of education for the state of Guanajuato. We, we brainstormed about ideas for using this technology in the classroom two or three years down the road. So, so um, there's a lot of interesting work here. I'm collaborating with um, Professor Silvina Montrul, who she's from Argentina. Uh, she's a professor of second language acquisition and linguistics. She's a world leading expert. She's at the University of Illinois, native speaker of Spanish, so very convenient for this kind of project. And I'm also working with my former Spanish teacher from high school, Nancy Wesselman, who's um, actually at the CIMATEL right now. She's visiting here with me and she also with, where, where, um, was visiting um, people today in Guanajuato, including the director of education. So, um, so we also visited the University of Guanajuato and um, the education department. So there's a lot of interesting possibilities for collaboration in this. Um, as a simple example, you could have children who want to learn English order American sandwiches in a virtual reality experience, try to read the menu and talk. And instead of having these people here, there could be children behind them as the voices, live, trying to take their orders and giving feedback if they understand. And of course, for the, um, for the children in the US, they could be at a, uh, you know, La Michoacana or at the paleteria and, and ordering paletas or something, right? So, so very nice. Um, maybe they, it will be in a virtual looking world. Maybe it could be like with some kind of imagery and tricks. I don't know, but that's kind of the vague idea that I have so far for this very new project, just starting. Um, and finally, just to have one final slide, how roboticists can contribute, all kinds of things. I mean robotics, vision, you know, all this kind of general area. Um, well, there, there's, there's better tracking systems that can be developed. Robotics, roboticists know a lot about tracking because the robots get lost and they need to know where they're at. Humans wearing a virtual reality headset also get lost, so we need to know exactly where they are to show them the right images. Um, all kinds of interesting telepresence applications and uses. Um, so, so we can imagine virtual travel or medicine, telemedicine, many different interesting possibilities. We can develop brand new sensing technologies. And of course, if you build very interesting virtual worlds, you of course need to use motion planning to, to, to figure out how to move all of these characters around in a very natural, realistic way as we inhabit our virtual worlds and do not want to feel lonely. All right, thank you very much.